Well, if you'll join me in John chapter 1, it's been our passage that we've been kind of sinking into here for Christmas. John chapter 1. And I'll read verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from the fullness, from, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Our God in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your grace upon grace, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, you bring salvation. Through Jesus, you bring reconciliation to yourself between you and your people. And God, on this special Christmas day, we celebrate that gift, Jesus Christ. And through Jesus, Salvation, hope for eternity, being reconciled to you, peace with you. God, fill our hearts with joy, overflowing joy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was younger, my family and I, during this time of year, we had about a 20 to 25 minute drive to get to church. And um, when my two sisters and I, when Chris, we were younger, we would be sitting on either sides of the car, and to pass the time, we would have a little competition on the way to church. Uh, whoever was on the left-hand side, whoever was on the right-hand side, we would compete to see who had the most Christmas, which the most houses with Christmas lights on outside. And so we would we'd be counting back and forth all the way. And uh, it passed the time. I remember exactly how many we had, but, but it was fun. It was always kind of capturing our attention, though, the Christmas lights. Maybe you have been spending some time, maybe as a family, finding an area where there's just Christmas lights everywhere, and you've gone to, to enjoy them. Uh, I was driving my daughter around, and uh, there was a home in Olmstead Falls right near a light. We were stopped, and the lights were just going crazy. And there was a sign out front that told you to tune in to a certain radio station. Well, didn't have time to stop and listen. I remember when that first became a thing. You know, of course, it was all over social media. Some guys somewhere had just this m incredible, magnificent display, and it was timed perfectly to the music, and you would just sit there and watch and just be wowed. Our passage is kind of like that. You know, last week we looked at verses 1 through 13, kind of that initial wow to the Christmas lights, but to Christmas. And we talked about the magnificence of Christmas is the gospel. What makes Christmas just a time where we step back and say, wow, is the gospel. But seeing this guy's yard with this 
elaborate setup, tuning into a radio station, the more you just stop and the more that you think about it. There's a lot that goes into that. It's pretty involved. The depth behind just the lights are pretty, pretty amazing. Number one, think about it as an electric bill. You stop and just think for a little bit. Two, you think about the time and energy that he put into it. And the more you think about it, the more profound, maybe, it becomes. Everything behind just the wow factor. Everything that makes that a wow factor. Well, the wow of Christmas is the gospel. The significance of Christmas is the incarnation. What makes Christmas a weighty matter for us is the gospel. The consequence of Christmas, the, the weightiness, the significance, the grandeur of Christmas, the, the gravity of Christmas is the incarnation. And this isn't working. Let's go. Boom. Now, of course, it goes too far. Here we go. The magnitude of Christmas is the incarnation. Be what makes the gospel reality possible, effective, is the incarnation. Other passages of scripture that explain to us or talk about the incarnation, I just want to draw our attention to. First is Romans 8 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Why and how? By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Hebrews 2.14, they're talking about what the incarnation is. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. That through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Philippians 2.5-7 Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped or to be held on to, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And then in Galatians, Paul writes, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. I think that verse illustrates not just the magnificence of Christmas, the magnificence of Christmas, the wow factor of Christmas, is the redeeming, is the salvation, but the significance of of Christmas. What makes that possible in order to redeem? God sends his son born of a woman born under the law. Redemption can't happen unless we have the incarnation. And the significance of Christmas, the weightiness, the profoundness, what makes Christmas magnificent is this thing called the incarnation. I just And John draws our attention. I just want to notice three things of what the incarnation is, as John tells us. And let me just read verses 14 through 18 again. The profound nature, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. This glory full of grace and truth. John bears witness about this word became flesh. John bore witness about him in verse 15 and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, John says, we have received, and I love this, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God. He who is at the Father's side, 
He has made him known. What is this incarnation? What is the significance, the weightiness about Christmas that makes it magnificent? Well, first of all, it's the incarnation. And he describes the incarnation, first of all, as miraculous. Those words, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He spent the first 13 verses talking about who the word is. Last week, we zeroed in on that. The creator, the life giver, the second person of the Trinity, fully divine, God himself. That's the word, the word coming into this world, Jesus Christ. When we think about the incarnation, it's helpful to be as exact as we can be. Otherwise, we can become confused and we miss the depth of it, the significance of it. When we talk about the incarnation, when we talk about the word Jesus Christ becoming flesh, it's, it's not God becoming flesh. It's the second person of the Trinity. It's Jesus Christ becoming flesh. It's not merely the second person. It's not merely Jesus Christ just appearing in, in human form. He became human. He was truly human. It's not, the, it's not the forming of a new person. When we think about children being born, it's a new person that is made. Well, the incarnation is not a new person being made. It is the divine person of Jesus Christ. But this person, the son, wasn't changed into a man. It's not like you took some humanity and some divinity and put them in a bowl and mixed them together and it became something else. He wasn't changed into something. He just took on flesh. And nothing about that second person of the Trinity changed. Only how the divine in the second person manifested himself. And it's the Son of God who took on full human nature. And Jesus Christ received that full human nature from his mother Mary via the virgin birth. It is miraculous. One person, two natures. Undiminished deity, true humanity, in an everlasting union where attributes of both natures are expressed in one person. Think and ponder this. Mary pondered everything that was happening to her that evening. The incarnation, nothing less than miraculous. And so I challenge us today to take a few minutes and just Meditate on the miraculous. Just kind of stop the busyness and just stop and just ponder and meditate on the person of Jesus Christ. There as a baby, undiminished deity, yet true humanity. Two natures in one person. That's who we're celebrating. Take a few minutes and just meditate and ponder on that. The Word became flesh. But John also says that this Word become flesh, this incarnation, dwelt among us. Not only is this incarnation miraculous, it is also personal. That this God become flesh, Jesus become flesh, lived with us, dwelt among us. That word dwelt is an important word. It's literally the word tabernacled. And all through the Old Testament, this is anticipated. God with his people. There in the Garden of Eden, God creates and speaks into existence and forms 
the man and forms the woman. And he dwells with them. What forces the separation is sin. Sin is not natural. And from that point, after Adam and Eve sinned and they were cast out of the garden, separated from God, this God with us is anticipated. Just the many times that God makes himself known to his people, whether it's to Abraham or even the children of Israel there on Mount Sinai, God makes his presence known. God's desire is to have his people with him. But there's this barrier of sin. He's with his Abraham and Jacob. He's with his Moses, makes himself known. And most visibly, there as they were exiting Egypt, he was with his people in this pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. And he says, I'm going I'm to dwell in the midst of you. You're going to build this tabernacle, this portable structure. And within the center of it is a, a special room, the Holy of Holies. And there I would dwell. And once they constructed that, the glory of God in that pillar by fire and cloud moved over top of that tabernacle. And the children of Israel, as they camped around it, could look and see the glory of God with them. Yet they could not go close to him. And that portable tabernacle, eventually God had them, through David and Solomon, build a permanent temple. For the same purpose. But because of the Israelites and their sin and rebellion against God, that glory departed that temple. And the next occurrence that we have is what John is saying here. That before our exile, the glory of God departed the temple. He didn't depart us, but he departed specifically the temple and his, his, his immediate presence. And now John is saying that the word in all of his glory tabernacled with us in the person of Jesus Christ. John would say in, at the end in verse 18 that it is this Jesus that makes the Father known why does, why does God dwell with his people so that his people could know him? Not know about him, but know him. Jesus would tell his disciples that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. If you've experienced my love, you've experienced the Father's love. By knowing me, you know the Father. You see, God's desire is for every person to know him. The greatest good for every person is knowing their creator. Not knowing about, but knowing their creator. And Jesus Christ makes that possible. You know, he's even given us human relationships to help us understand what that means between a, a created being, finite, and an infinite creator. He's given us other finite relationships. You think about what you desire in your own home with your own spouse and family is to be known and understood. And, and that knowing and understanding to be what guides the other person's relationship with you. Like, why has God designed it that way? It's because that's God's design for you with Him. To give us a tangible experience, an expression, and a foretaste for eternity. When we will know Him to our fullest capacity. And in the joy of knowing Him, live out eternity. That's why Jesus came. It is personal. 
And so I challenge us today, this week, to practice withness this year. Practice being with those you love. And operating out of your understanding and knowledge of those that you are with. And allow that to guide and direct your time. To practice withness this year. It's the incarnation that is, it is miraculous. It's the only explanation for it. But it is also personal. God and Jesus Christ taking on flesh so that finite human beings can know their creator. But it is also glorious. There we go. John says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. And he says that this glory is the glory that can only come from the only Son, from the Father. There are lesser glories here in this world, but the kind of glory that John and his disciples and his fellow disciples saw in Jesus was the kind of glory that only comes from God. You think about, well, how did John behold the glory I think our first is maybe as you start to think about how you would answer that, it would have been in Jesus' own ministry, his miracles, beholding the glory of God, his teachings and how they rang with truth. John was one of the few that saw Jesus Christ transfigured, where that shieldedness the, the veil kind of was pulled back and Jesus in all of his divine glory shone forth and John was there to view that and witness it. His glory was seen in his resurrection and in his ascension into heaven. Even John the Baptist would say that his glory was represented and that this one of whom I am testifying he comes after me, but he ranks before me. He's of higher rank than me. Why? Because he came before me. John would emphasize that in verse 1. The word was God and with God, and he was there in the beginning. But he talks about his glory in a couple different phrases that I just want to draw. He says, first of all, this glory, the kind that only comes from the Father... This glory was full of grace and truth. And the Jewish mind, as they would hear what John is saying, would be taken back all the way to Mount Sinai. As Moses was on the top of the mountain. Exodus 33 and 34. And Israel had just built that golden calf and just immediately rebelled against God and started false worship. Moses goes down and he breaks the tablets and he goes up to intercede for his people with God. And God's like, you know, I'm just going to start, I'm just going to totally destroy them and start this new nation with you, Moses. And Moses says, no, don't do this. Let the nations around see you. Continue this work. And God agrees. And Moses says, listen, we can't keep moving unless your presence is with us. And Moses says, can I see you? And then God says that, yes, I will show you my presence. And he says, I will show you my glory and when my, all of my goodness passes before you. The goodness of God is his glory. And in the very next chapter, God tells Moses his name and how he is to be remembered, which becomes kind of a cornerstone description for all of the New Te Old Testament. This is the description by which God is to be known and remembered. 
that he is a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but also a God who will by no means clear the guilty. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Grace and truth. And John is building this bridge, and he's saying the very God that made himself known on Mount Sinai to Moses, to his people, is this word, Jesus Christ. His glory was in grace and truth, in steadfast love and faithfulness. But he also says that this glory, in verse 16, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. This incarnation is glorious, so the fullness of God is expressed in the grace and truth in Jesus Christ and making the Father known, but also this sense of John and his, disciples, his fellow disciples receiving grace upon grace. The favor of God upon the favor of God toward his people. I think initially we would think that this just, we could describe as, you know what, this is just one blessing after another. God just pouring out one blessing after another. Possibly, but John qualifies the statement of grace upon grace in verse 17. That we have received grace upon grace, and this is why or how, because the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, I think John has this idea that there was this grace that came for God's people in the form of the Old Testament law. This was God's favor to them in giving the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law was a good thing. The Jewish people made it an end in and of itself. It wasn't intended for that. It was God's goodness to his people so that they could relate to him. It was an act of God's grace. The law was also weakened by sinful human flesh. The law made it absolutely clear that a sinful human being cannot live up to that standard. But the Old Testament law also pointed forward to Jesus Christ. It anticipated the coming of the Messiah. It prophesied the coming of the Messiah. And where the Old Testament law fell short, this grace, this goodness, now comes the word. Jesus Christ, become flesh, incarnate, is God's grace upon that grace. And what the Old Testament law could not do, what the Old Testament accentuated, but it also yearned. Jesus brings. And that's righteousness. The Old Testament law accentuated the absolute necessity of a perfect righteousness before God. But the Old Testament law also yearned for the righteousness that's not there in his people. And Jesus Christ is that righteousness. And that is why Jesus Christ is the grace that is upon grace. And so I encourage us and challenge us this Christmas is to celebrate the one who provides all you lack. Not one of us here in this room has sufficient righteousness to be with God. For we are sinful human beings. We are so sinful that the prophet Isaiah would say that even our attempts to do good are as filthy rags, stained by sin. 
But God doesn't lower the standard. He keeps the standard of holiness and perfection, but he provides the righteousness that we lack in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, his birth, as we celebrate, rightly so today, begins a path to a death that he did not deserve, but as a substitute. Providing for us the payment, the debt that our sin brings, paying it in full. But not just paying our debt in full, also providing above and beyond the righteousness that we is void in our life, that is empty, we don't have. He says, take my righteousness. Debt paid, righteousness provided. You can now stand before your creator as holy and righteous and enjoy him for eternity. That's who our Savior is. I trust that you have accepted that gift of payment paid in full and righteousness as your own. What a joy it would be as this Christmas perhaps was your first day of being right with God, enjoying Him through Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. For those those of us who have trusted Jesus and stand in him and have a righteousness that is not our own, a righteousness that appeases and satisfies our creator. And we can know our creator. This Christmas, celebrate what Jesus provides. For it's that baby boy who is, that's your righteousness. Righteousness. That is your substitute. Celebrate him for who he is. The significance, the magnitude, the weightiness of Christmas is the incarnation. The word becoming flesh. Jesus Christ, undiminished deity, true humanity, providing all that we lack truly miraculous, truly personal, and wonderfully glorious. Our Heavenly Father, our Creator, without Jesus Christ, we are dead in our sins, separated from you for eternity, paying the debt you've demonstrated your great love for us in sending your son taking on flesh living and dying being buried being raised again as our substitute paying our debt and providing our want of righteousness fill our hearts with joy and celebration to celebrate the magnitude and the magnificence of Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen.